Hi everyone, my name is Gopika Spanley and I serve as a career advisor at Georgetown McDonough working with the MBA Career Center. And I'm thrilled to be uh, hosting an, part of an, uh, an event today that's focused on navigating uh, virtual career fairs. This is part of a week-long series of events on um, navigating the virtual world of recruitment. And I am super excited to be joined today by um, a friend and, and partner, uh, Roger Antoniozzo. Um, and uh, Roger has been working with us at Georgetown McDonough, specifically with um, MBAs, helping to recruit and helping to work with our students and really have a, what has a wonderful internship program, which we'll hopefully learn more about at some point. Um, but really the focus of today is Roger's experience um, taking part in virtual career fairs and um, would love to get his thoughts, recommendations, and advice to all of you who will be soon taking part in these as well. So first of all, welcome Roger and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, first of all, for the honor of inviting me and uh, for sharing my knowledge with um, your amazing students. Terrific. Well, Roger was sharing with me that, um, uh, as in many cases, um, and I should, I should mention that Roger serves as University Relations Manager of Abbott, um, has planning to take part in a number of uh, virtual career fairs this fall um, and has historically done so as well. In fact, they have a specific day called the National Day of Hiring, which will be on October 6th, where they'll be hosting their own virtual career fair. Is that right, Roger? Absolutely. Uh, Tuesday, October the 6th, we will host the National Day of Hiring and it will be for undergrad and for grad student as well. How can you be invited? You can check our Abbott Career um, on site, the site, and actually uh, click to email University Relation, and we will send you an invite. Otherwise, they can let you know, and I will send them an invite. Terrific. Well, we'll look out for that. Um, I guess my first question for you, Roger, is um, you've obviously taken part in a lot of in-person and virtual career fairs. Um, what are some of the benefits for students in taking part in these fairs? Um, why should a student think about taking part or participating? So that's a very good question. <clears throat> and I will say that we will address career fair today, but also we will address at the same time virtual career fair. But I will say that they are, career fairs are excellent networking opportunity. Why? Because they are filled with professionals that actually work in your chosen field mm -hmm. that you're going to be want to study, that you're going to be work in. But also more than anything, it gives you, remember, at the end of the day, it's all about networking, but also building your brand. And you attending a virtual career fair does give you a great opportunity to do that and a great advantage over other candidates who might not necessarily attend them or see the benefit of. That's very true. I think the, uh, it's a great way to kick off broadening your network and establishing connections that you might not otherwise have during the course of your studies or program. Um, when you think about how one should best prepare for a career fair, what types of resources and materials do you advise students to look at? How should they plan to really get ready for, for an event like this? So um, that's a very good question because sometimes it is um, easy to get a little bit lost in the shuffle. Why? Because career fairs are great, but let's face it, they do have a lot of employers, all amazing ones. They do have a lot of representatives. Some of the career fair employers might have four, 10, 20 people there. So you wanna make sure that you do your homework. And how do you do that, okay? First of all, research the, career, um, the company that they're going to be at the career fair. Are you interested in all of them? Well, chances are that you're probably not. At the same time, so what you can do, you can zero on the one that you are interested. I'll say, okay, I get it that we all have certain wishes. This is my number one company, Abbott, let's use Abbott. It is the number one company that I wanna work at. That's fantastic, I love hearing that. But at the same time, you have to be realistic. So instead of zero on one, of course you can top, you can choose your number one. But zero maybe on five, 
10, 15, and do a little bit research. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say, we as recruiters, managers, business leaders, representing the company at the career fair, don't expect you to be an expert. Mm -hmm. It's a given. We know that. We also know that you have a lot of opportunities. We also know that you might not necessarily know what you want to do. That's why you go to school, okay? But at the same time, we do like when you know a little bit of our company. Mm -hmm. You cannot know everything, absolutely. I have to tell you, I probably do not know everything about my company. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, do a little bit of reading, do a little bit of research on the companies that you are exploring because that will give you an advantage. Terrific. Yeah. I mean, I recommend to students that you obviously start with the uh, website of the company, but go further than that. Look at articles if you can, at least see what their social media feeds talk about. Um, you know, get, a, get a, a better feel for the company overall, and then maybe specifically a product or the set of products um, that you might be personally interested in. Um, Which is perfect segue, because you mentioned social media. What, what do we usually advertise on social media? Our newest news, update, discovery, product. So like you said, take a look at the website, do a little bit of in-depth research, but check social media because usually we're advertising what we're going through at the moment. So it really gives you an advantage when you walk up to a recruiter, you're talking to a recruiter and say, oh, I saw you got approved for this, or I saw your company starting to produce this. You know, you just put it on social media, but it does work. So excellent point that you brought up. Yeah, it shows another layer of frankly, of doing your homework and um, already starting to have more, perhaps a, a better question than some other candidates might have. Um, what is your take on uh, whether candidates should apply for roles prior to actually taking part in these fairs? So sometimes, well, usually companies do post roles, I think. Um, what is your recommendation on that front, Roger? Okay. So you will hear probably different answers on this one. Depends who you ask to. I will give you my personal take that I also share with my fellow um, uh, peers at Abbott. You shouldn't, okay? Do not worry, okay? Um, this is why you're going to the career fair, okay? Do your research, look into it. Maybe if you're really determined to apply for a certain job for a certain company and that's your number one, then maybe go ahead and do it. But at the same time, I will say, this is why you go to career fair, to see what's available and what's out there. And also remember, if the recruiter that you're talking to and you're very interested in their company or their position said, have you applied yet? You can also say, no, but I will as soon as I get home. Because okay. remember, as soon as you get home, it's probably still uh, earlier than when the recruiter is going to be down at the fair. So you already be in the system by then. Okay. So there's, from your perspective, at least, it, the, you know, recruiters don't hold it against you if you've not already applied for a position. Okay. No. That's good. To we know. don't. That's good to know. Actually, it kind of showcased that um, if you apply after that, um, this might be, once again, everybody is a little bit different. We all see things in a very different way. But to me, it actually says more that after talking to me, you apply for the role because it showcases that, wow, you're really interested and committed rather than maybe before where you didn't know much about it and you went and I had. Okay, good. To but there's no wrong answer. I want to specify. There's no wrong okay. answer here. Okay. Um, so when a student enters a virtual booth, which is essentially how a lot of the upcoming fall conferences or fall career fairs will look like. Um, what do you recommend? How should a student gain um, your attention? What should they, I guess, type? What's the sort of the protocol? So um, it is a little bit different. And it is a little something that we all are adjusting to. I mean, let's be fair. Maybe two years ago, we would have never asked these questions. You know, it would never cross our mind to do this. However, because of this new normal, everybody is adapting. True, my department has been doing this for two years. Some company probably just started, but I don't think we have an exact manual at this time being. So what I will say is that try to find a way to start a conversation, okay? Maybe you start with a personal story 
okay? Maybe you start why you're attra um, attracted to the company or why you're interested in this position, but trying to find a common ground, but also trying to find an item of conversation that will get that going, okay? Open up the dialogue and showcase why you are the best candidate for the position. But I will say, and I will probably repeat it later on again, do remember one thing, okay? It is virtual and the, our attention span is a little bit shorter when we are on video rather than when we are in person. So always be respectful of time that the recruiter, the business leader is giving you. Make sure that you set it up, but you don't go overboard. Great. So you suggest maybe starting with a quick introduction um, and then moving on to a question, I assume, something that they're curious about related to the company. Yes, open up the dialogue. Because let's also remember the fact that uh, representative, the company representative, they're going to see a lot of candidates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is that you're trying to do? You're trying to build your brand and you're trying to differentiate yourself from the other candidates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, find your little story. Ask the little questions because that will open up the conversation. Yeah, and that sort of leads to the next question, which you've started to answer, I think, you know, when you think back about candidates you've met, either in person or virtually, Roger, what catches your eye? How are you interested um, in it? How do you get interested in a candidate and, and, and what do they do to, to stimulate that? So uh, this is a very good question and I love it because we all like to be creative and we all like to think out of the box, okay? That's why you go to a great school like Georgetown. At the same time, there are times where you do not want to go too rogue. You do not want to go too crazy out there, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Let me use an example. Um, let me use a simple one, a resume, okay? Yes, you're not gonna have a resume in your hand, but it's going to be virtual. Make sure it's uploaded, make sure it's updated, and make sure that it is one page. I don't, you know, one of the biggest turn off for many of the uh, recruiters is the fact when we see two or three pages resume, okay? So, um, just sticking to that, um, I understand that you want to make sure that your resume stands out, that you're creative and everything, but when it comes to resume, we all like a certain look, mm. okay? So don't go too rogue on that. Um, one page, make sure it's clean, and I don't mean clean from a clean perspective. Make sure that, you know, the font and everything. It is a little bit easier sometimes to say, oh, I'm going to use a very large font, or my resume is very lengthy, so I'm going to shrink it down to a very small font. So something as simple as that can actually make it different, okay? Now, maybe some of you might say, well, I have a lot of experience. Maybe you're a grad, but maybe undergrad as well. I have a lot of experience, and I want to make sure that I highlight all of that. Well, then maybe just put the names and the title, okay? Don't put all the different... Um, duties and responsibilities that you did because let's be fair in some cases it's a given okay we see the title we understand what you did and also remember always works that way if a recruiter or somebody has a question and they want to know more about it they will ask you and in some cases i actually ask more questions where i just see a title or the name of a place where they work because they couldn't put everything there and then i certainly ask for more information and more detail. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful, Roger. Yes, I mean, and it's certainly consistent what we what we talk about at Georgetown McDonough, which is trying to ensure we always keep it to one page, that we make it easily readable, um, strong keywords, um, to really to make sure that from a recruiter's perspective or employer's perspective, it's easily digestible. So I'm glad to hear glad to hear you agree with us. Um, are there any things that you have found other than resumes in terms of interaction points that kind of put you off or you just would suggest that students stay away from? Yes, um, this is something that probably your school is professors are telling you and probably something that I will tell you as well, which it is your 30 second commercial, your elevator pitch. Those are great. Keep them. If you don't have one, make sure that you create one. And I'm sure career services can help you. I'm sure your peers, mentors can help you. At the same time, you know, 
With great power comes great responsibility. Be careful how you use it. What does it mean is that often as we attend a lot of these great um, events, career fairs of the school, national events, we have a lot of students. And students come up, maybe we have a line, maybe we don't have a line and everything. And some students, when you ask them a question, you might ask them about the resume. And they're so eager, they're so eager to give you their 30 seconds commercial, their pitch, that no matter what you ask them, that's what they give you. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, uh, not just mine, many of the others, what goes through our mind is not what I ask you. Mm -hmm. So uh, please have one. They are vital. They're important. You need to have one. Make sure that it's rehearsed. It's great. It's 30 seconds. But don't just reuse it automatically. That is Use it well, accordingly. Yeah, and listen to the because question. Listen to what you're being asked, right? I mean, you want to make sure that it looks like you are hopefully attentive um, to people. So that's a great point. I had not. I, I, we do certainly encourage um, what we call tell me about yourselves or elevator pitches, but you're right. It needs to be used in the right way <laughs> at the right moment. Yes, and I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example, not to go into much about this topic, but you know, you have students and come up, they show you your resume, their name, where they go to school, and you start them out, oh, I see these on your resume. Oh, can I tell you my, uh, my pitch? Or can I tell you my 30 seconds elevator? Yeah. Yes, you can, but not necessarily what I asked. So like you said, uh, listen to the question. Hmm. Um, you had touched upon this earlier on, um, but I'm curious, how does the one-on-one -on -one chats or videos occur? So I assume you're sort of in these virtual booths, then typically from your experience, Roger, do you then have separate conversation, I assume, with students or candidates that you're more interested in getting to know about? What does that process look like for, for you at least in Abbott? So um, that's a very good question. And it really depends on the fair. Some fairs are massively large. Some are more, um, you know, customized and everything. So there is uh, a booth. In some case, it really depends. There are two kinds of booths. There's a video booth and there's a chat booth, mm -hmm. okay? So um, it really depends which one do you have. A video one, which is something that you're probably gonna see more and more now, because, well, that's everybody's in the same situation. And uh, it gives you a little bit more of a personalized attention. The chat one, I do have to tell you, I don't personally love it because it's very impersonal. Mm -hmm. And literally, you could be, I mean, as far as I know, you know, you could be talking to a bot, you know? So it really doesn't give that. However, I understand we also use them, not putting that down. We use them. Some companies do because you have to do that. But, um, so I don't know if I have a perfect answers for you right now. Maybe in six months, in a year, we're going to see a major shift and we're going to have kind of a manual down on how to interact, behave and everything. But I would say if you are in the video one, make sure, just like we talked about it before, you look at your best. And also that you have everything around you prepared and did a little bit of research. So I'm not quite sure I give you a perfect answer to what you're looking for, but I'm sure that probably in a few months or next year, I'll give you a much better one. No, that's great. I mean, it's, I think what, what the message is, is you're gonna need to be versatile. You're not quite sure. Some of these fairs, it may in fact be a, a very, um, it will be video chats or Zoom functions of sorts. In others, it'll actually potentially just be a chat function. And so you need to be able to move across both uh, mediums and, you also, to your point before, you need to be ready to be on camera <laughs> and be polished and look professional and make sure you have a copy of your resume easily um, available. So um, yes, to your point, we'll probably learn more or certainly across the next six months and have more to share by next year. Um, what about your recommendations to how to think strategically about visiting booths? You had mentioned before, presumably a student has identified, gosh, I don't know, 10 companies that they might really want to interact with during the course of a day. Um, what, is your, what is your approach or recommendation to those students? So um, as we mentioned before, make sure you do your research, but also try to balance out your time and resources. So virtual um, career fair, might have a little bit of a shorter span uh, because of their nature. At the same time, you can still make an impact. 
So um, is there a methodology that I specifically recommend? Well, everybody's different, okay? And every company um, is also, depends on what field you are looking to go mm -hmm. to. I'm sure that, you know, if you're looking in the tech space versus the finance space, what well, those are, you shall see a little bit of a difference there. But I would say that um, try to maximize it, just like you would in a regular career fair. Try to maximize your time. Try to pick your top 10, 12. Maybe that's too much if you want to say, well, Roger, that's too much. I want to pick my top five. That's perfect. But just remember, as we go back to the conversation we had before, make sure that you don't just pick your top one. But um, top five, top 10, and make sure that you do have an adequate amount of time with the representative of the company so you can make an impact. Yeah, I think that's really an important point, Roger. I think um, you can't just drop in on a booth and sort of pull out if you're going to have a meaningful interaction or hopefully maybe have an exchange or maybe even interview at some point. Um, so I think you're, you're right that um, being, being thoughtful about it, being intentional, um, it makes a lot of sense. And, and then flexible to your point, because perhaps one booth you're trying to visit still has a, lot of, has a long line or sort of a waiting area you may want to think about moving to another company and coming back. So you're going to need to be flexible. Um, so you are a very seasoned and experienced talent manager. Um, and I wanted to get your thoughts. And I know students are eager to hear. So what are you, when you were, when you were meeting with candidates, what skills are you looking for? What do you place an extreme value on uh, in those interactions? So I would say that um, many, students and many people place a lot of importance in technical skills. Technical skills are very important. At the same time, I also believe that technical skills can be taught. So if you don't have that and you need them in order to function at this job or our company, this internship, we can teach you that. However, soft skills is something that you naturally have and that's probably what we're looking for. So my two top ones, I get these questions a lot. And I love this question because I really get to showcase what we're looking for um, myself, for our program, but also for our company. Two things, flexibility, which you just mentioned before, and passion, mm -hmm. okay? What does it mean? When we say flexibility, we mean that uh, we are avid. We're a very large company. We have four divisions, you know, nutrition, diagnostic, medical device, and outside of the U.S., we still have a large pharmaceutical presence, not in the U.S. anymore, okay? So we are a large company. So we have to wear different hats. And there's no such thing at Evan as that's not my job. Mm -hmm. When you join us as an intern, full-time candidate, manager, director, whatever the position might be, you might be asked to stretch your capabilities more. Why? Because we're a large company and we have a need for that. We are growing, which is great, and uh, we want to make sure that you are successful. So you might be hired as an intern for nutrition or might be hired as an MBA for medical devices. But do remember during your internship or career, you will have to cross over the other division. So I want to make sure that you understand what the company is about and there's flexibility right there. Okay. Second one, passion. We are a healthcare company, and we truly take a lot of passion for what we do. You know, at Abbott, um, everything that we do as a company is for somebody who has a need, whether it's medical device, diagnostic, but even nutrition. We don't, for example, in nutrition do water bottle. Nothing wrong. Absolutely great. We need them. But everything that we do at, um, at Abbott is for somebody who has a need. Somebody that cannot eat, they cannot digest, they cannot process food, they cannot process certain proteins or vitamins. So we truly have a passion for healthcare and we have, you have to have a passion for what we do. We do save people lives and it goes back to the motto of our company, which it is life to the fullest. We want to make sure that yes, our customers, they get to live their lives to the fullest, but also our employee go by the same mantra and motto. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I think both skills you brought up, um, Roger, are extremely important. I mean, flexibility, particularly at this time, and I think 
um, you know, COVID-19, if nothing else, has underscored and, and reinforced the fact that people will and need to be adaptive. Um, and so, um, but, but I can imagine that that's something that's even more important right now. So, um, and then the passion, which, you know, at the end of the day, that's what's going to drive you to your job. That's what's going to drive hard work and commitment. And I always talk to students about making sure that the mission of the company matches up with your own personal values and beliefs. It's really important. And obviously, Abbott has such uh, an important mission at heart. So um, that that's very, very helpful to hear, Roger. I guess my final question for you is, um, you know, if you were to put, put yourself in a student's shoes these days or, you know, uh, given, thinking about and reflecting upon your experience, like what are your, ed, what is your best advice to students? What should they be thinking about as they head into this fall with this kind of a lot of uncertainties and, you know, a new way of recruiting? That's a very good question. And I like that. And I think it goes down to something that I've been preaching to myself and to some of the candidates or people who reach out. There are three things you need to do. Dress for success, mm. get organized, and make sure that make the first impression count. Mm. So dress for success, okay? Now, it's still gonna be virtual, that's okay, but you still wanna make sure that you represent your best. You want to make sure that you are your best. So dress for success. Do you have to wear a shirt and a tie if you're a gentleman? I'm speaking for, for example, for a gentleman. Maybe not a tie, maybe you can have a shirt, maybe you don't even have a jacket, but make sure that everything looks pristine because once again, you wanna make sure that, you're, that the company representative is seeing you as part of the company. Will this person fit in with my company image? Will this person represent my company at, at its best? So number one. Number two, get organized. Make sure that your resume is up to date. Make sure that it's just one page and uh, do research on the company. You know, be prepared. And number three, make the first impression count. Something that you heard all along, but these are probably the, my top three rules when it comes to any career fair, whether it's in person or virtual. Terrific, That's, what great advice, Roger. Um, and I absolutely agree with you wholeheartedly about all of those. Um, you know, you're, you're, this is your personal brand, and so how you present yourself is really, really critical um, in these interactions. Um, so I, I guess that brings us to a conclusion. Um, I just wanted again thank you so much, Roger, for your time, your wisdom, your advice. I know our students will really be eager to hear this, and. Um, look forward to connecting with you at some of the virtual fairs and also having you join the MBAs for a presentation later this fall. So we're, we're very excited about that. And um, thank you so much. No, thank you so very much. This was truly an honor. And uh, as we mentioned before about social media, make sure you look me up. You can look me up on LinkedIn, Roger and Pignazzo, but I'm also on Twitter. If you need, but LinkedIn is probably where you need to be and make sure that you do have all those rules that we talked about it before and all those points because you want to be at your best. Terrific words to end by. So thanks so much, Roger.